Hello, and welcome to Marriage Unchained, the art of one flesh, where saving marriages, saving families, and saving souls is the flavor of the day. Now, let's join our host and author of Marriage Unchained, Catholic Alpha Radical, Jerry Jacobs Jr. Welcome to Catholic Alpha Radical Live, where I help you fix your Catholic marriage. I've coached and helped hundreds of men in their marriages, and now I want to help you. Call 313 Radical now. That's area code 313 Radical, and ask me anything on tough marital issues, such as what to do when she's asked for divorce. What to do when you have a mutual agreement of separation, but you didn't want it. What to do when your wife is cold and distant. What to do when your wife is having an affair. What to do when your marriage is bad, boring, lukewarm, and passionless. What to do when you engage in a mental embrace less than once a month. What to do when you sleep in separate bedrooms. What to do when she has left the home with or without the children. What to do when you're divorced but didn't want it. Call 313 Radical. That's area code 313 723 4225. That's area code 313 723 4225. Again, call 313 Radical right now for answers to intimacy problems, communication problems, prayer and spiritual warfare problems, authentic masculinity problems, aka how to man up. So, Sit back, relax, take a chill pill, and get ready to rock. But don't duck. Can you feel it? Catholic Alpha Radical coming at you now. Hello, I'm Jerry Jacobs Jr. and welcome to Catholic Alpha Radical Live, Save My Catholic Marriage Minute, where my main mission is to keep you out of divorce court. The Save My Catholic Marriage Minute is for you if your marriage has very little no commo- uh, emotional closeness, your wife has asked for a divorce, your wife has left the home, or you're separated, your wife is in the home, but you're in separate bedrooms, your marriage is just plain boring or has no passion. You engage in the marital embrace less than weekly or severe less than once a month. You are divorced but didn't want it. Basically, this episode is for you if you are in marriage crisis, and that's what all of those things are, okay? So, in this 59th episode, I ask, what are the clues your wife may want a divorce? Clue number 21, plus live calls from you answering your marriage questions. So, please call now and get in the queue. I've helped hundreds of men in their marriages. Please give me the chance to help you get your little booty booty butt in the queue. <laughs> hey, that kind of rhymed, didn't it? <laughs> get in the queue and call 313 Radical. That's 313 723 4225 so you can get some resolution to your marriage confusion. <laughs> All right, the quote of the day, fellas. We're here with the quote of the day. So the quote of the day, quote, something has happened to man to make him what he is. Whatever he is, he is not what he ought to be. All the disorder and anarchy, both within himself and society, possess the earmarks of being due to an abuse of freedom. Even though man now and then acts as if he lived in a jungle, one can still see in him 
some of his actions that he once played in a garden. End quote. Archbishop Fook J. Sheen, book three, to get married. I've helped hundreds of men in their marriages. Allow me to help you in yours. Get live Catholic marriage help. Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. Eastern, for some resolution to your marriage confusion. All right, all right, we are back, 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 back. Man, I feel kind of hyped up today. Not like yesterday, y'all. I was all down, not down, but I didn't have no energy. I was a little, I was like dragging, and I felt like it too. But today, I feel more like myself, and I hope that I come through to you guys as the same, because the, the, the worst thing I want to do is bore you to death. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, we have our first caller this morning. That's great. That's great. That's great. So we are going to bring them on right now. So let me bring them on. Hello? Caller? Hello? Yes. How are it's you? Scott. Hey, Scott. How you doing? Just fine. So, bro. Hey, I just want to let you know I had an incident at church this past weekend. Oh, what happened? I stood up in the front of the parish about five feet from the altar at attention with my dog. I walked in on St. Gabriel's Church. It's the closest church to my uh, home, and um, it's not a very warm and inviting church because they don't sing that much. The people don't sing in the pews. It's a very boring, dull, uncharismatic church, unlike the one I'm, I'm a member at of St. Edward's. So I made a, a point of showing up at that church with my dog and stood at attention the whole mass. And the priest actually came down and disrupted the mass as I was standing in front of the altar. I was just standing there to be a soldier towards Christ. And unfortunately, the police came and they um, did not arrest me. But I just went to parade rest. Whenever they asked me a question, I said, I have a weapon in my pocket. And that weapon was the rosary beads. So when they pulled it out of my pocket, they immediately knew I was not a threat. But it had so many people disruptive because I'm tired of the Catholic Church in Louisville not serving wine with the mass. Wow. Now, you're a very smart man. So thinking back on that, what would it Thinking back as you've had a whole four or five days to reflect on that, what, do you, what, what, what have you come to conclude? Well, then I went to my next mass where <laughs> I went to. Uh, okay. All right. All right. Let's go. What you got? Then I went to my home parish and it was a Spanish speaking mass, which I don't speak fluent Spanish. So my parish priest who I play golf with and I'm good friends with saw me broad jump to receive communion. He didn't serve me wine either. So I scared two parishes into thinking I'm a crazy 56-year-old man. And basically what had happened is I am now in contact with the Archbishop of Louisville to actually have a meeting with him and uh, three of the priests that have been involved in my, uh, my marriage crisis. Uh-huh. So you, you've got to reason. go ahead. I'm sorry. The reason why I did this, this is all the bigger plan that it has to be about God. And I'm getting sick and tired of them not serving the wine against the teachings because down in Orlando in the diocese of Orlando, where we have a secondary home, they still serve wine down there. So this whole COVID thing and the whole fear that they put into the people's hearts, I'm willing to die for receiving the blood of Christ. And I stood there at attention the entire time during mass and it freaked people out because I was in the center and they said, why don't you stand in the back? And I said, why should I? I'm here just like anybody else. Just because I stood in the middle, I said, you didn't have a problem with me being in my military dress blues the last time I was in this church, which was back in 2016. It's the closest parish to my house, and I bypassed it to go to other ones because it's not as charismatic as the other parishes within the uh, archdiocese. So what I learned from this is, if you stand up for what you believe in, you can make change even within the Catholic Church. And I completely agree, but let me, let me, let's go from the 
view of Christ and his church. Okay. Let's let me try to help you a little bit. Uh, uh, good luck on that one. No, well, <laughs> well, honestly, I, 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 your vigor is unprecedented and that, and for that alone, you should be, you should be given, you know, honor and respect. But here's the thing. First of all, no parish has to give both bread and wine because either one of them is okay. So if you get just the wine, you get the full body and blood. If you get just the just the, the species, you get the full wine and blood. So when I our parish and many parishes, Latin mass parish is basically the best mass you can get. It's the high mass. It's the extraordinary form. Every Sunday when we go, we sit, we kneel at the uh, we kneel at the uh, the banister, the communion rail. And all the priest does is he gives us the species. The, that's it. We don't get wine. Now, when he's up there uh, consecrating, he gives, he takes the wine and the species with himself. But when he comes down with us, he just gives us the species. And it's not because of COVID or anything like that. We've been doing that since I've been in that church for seven, eight, nine, ten years now. The reason why is in, in is in the, the uh, doctrine of the church that you either species, both of them or either or still constitutes. Cause here's, this is one of the reasons why let's say you're in a war situation. You can't get wine there. All the priest has is the species. What are you going to do? So that's why either one, that's, that's just one good example of why either or is acceptable and you get the full body and blood of Christ. But also the other thing, I I'm worried about what you did only because you said it because it kind of even though you you were in a military uniform and you were you know you were very no not this time I was in regular um, oh, street okay. clothes okay well even though even though you were very respectful you really didn't cause any havoc or anything like that the only time that really a person should stand up and disrupt mass well let me give you a story because I want to really you to understand because I don't I when you do things I want you to do it right and what I'm saying is what you not what you did was not exactly right but I uh, agree with your vigor but like uh, maybe last year there was a man that came to our parish and he came to Latin Mass he was very devout he loved Christ but he was African from Africa and so what he would do and we didn't know him so we didn't know him so what he would do, he started coming, and then in the back, during the during the middle of mass, he would stand up in mass and start yelling and screaming with his hands spread out. Now, in Africa, where he went to mass, that's kind of how they celebrate. You can do that at the at the at the Catholic mass. You can do that, and it's acceptable. Well, because people know you and they kind of understand it. But as us, we did not know him, and that's not our practice. You see what I'm saying? That's not our tradition. So what had to happen sure. was we had to go, two or three of us men had to go in the back and had to corral him and say, look, man, you can't do that. And then after mass, our, fa our father talked to him and then he came and did it again. So my point of what I'm saying is, and so what you did was kind of like that. It threw people off and it wasn't that they probably didn't agree with what you did. They just didn't understand. And the other thing is really the only time that us as laity are obliged to stand up and interrupt the mass where enough where the priest feels he has to call a police or come down is if he is up there preaching heresy. So why? Because the Holy Spirit will demand that some man in that church stands up and says, stop that right now. So what's an example of that? So let's say a preacher's up there and he's saying, you know, during the when the when Christ fed the five thousand, that it, they were every the reason there was so much fish and bread is because there was uh oh because they were everybody was sharing with each other. I know Scott, you've heard that one. Oh, they're all sharing yeah. with each other. Right then, a man in that church that's heresy because basically that priest is up there saying that Christ is not God, that that was not a miracle, and the Holy Spirit demands justice for that. So that being said, man. 
I just wanted you, I'm not disagreeing with what you did. What I'm saying is I just wanted you to understand more the broad perspective of, of, of what's going on. Does that make sense? Sure. Which is fine. I, I did it to prove a point that there's too many things happening with the Catholic Church I don't agree with. Amen. One is being Amen. The, the, the sex abuse scandal that continues. I'm reading up now that it's actually happening in the Vatican now. Amen. When there's yep. clergy in the Vatican doing things that are completely inappropriate. I've read about how the Cardinals were influencing um, junior priests to do things that are inappropriate. And I don't agree with the fact that they got altar girls up there because altar girls can't become priests. They Amen. can become nuns, yep. but they can't become priests. And that's the whole reason why I did it. So one of the gentlemen says, you're scaring my daughter. I said, she should be scared. She shouldn't be allowed to be alone with the priest until they completely eradicate everything that's gone on in the church. And that's why I think so many people have walked away from the Catholic faith is they use that crutch of saying they covered up the abuse that they have been doing for decades since before we were born. And so I just took oh, no. a stand for something I believed in. Yeah. Go ahead. And I agree. I, I really do agree. And look, man, one of the reasons why we have problems now is because men and wives aren't passing the faith on the true faith on to their children anymore. Even the Orthodox Christians, they really, you know, everybody, we've all been to the world. And so we start, we start compromising with God. And all you did was say, look, man, I'm done with that crap. <laughs> you know, um, and, and, and they didn't know how to handle it. They really didn't know how to handle it. Yeah, they don't. Um, well, it doesn't matter. Like when you try to contact a bishop and try to get an appointment with them, they don't they stay in the protection of that building, that that big building that they're in. And they they use their 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 minions to keep you out because they don't want to deal with it. Matter of fact, man, they don't even know how to deal with it anymore. Most of them, they don't pray like they're supposed to. They don't go to adoration like Archbishop Archbishop Full J. Sheen would do. He went to adoration every single day because why he understood the battle. But the priest, you can always tell when a priest and bishop are not praying. You can always tell they start going against God. They start talking about the things you were just talking about. And that, but the, but the, whole, the whole key to all this is this, man. Scott, this is, which you already know, this is a complete battle. This is a spiritual warfare battle that men must enter daily. And if we don't, we get what we have. We cannot fight the church outside the church. And that's the problem that Christ and the Christ has with Protestants is that it's 40,000 denominations, man, 40,000 of them and, or more. Hell, I don't even know now, but we will never defeat Satan split up into 40,000 denominations. That's the problem with this whole deal. What do you think? I agree because when I went to confession last Monday, not this past Monday, because I was in the hospital for three nights. Um, from Monday night to, uh, I just got out yesterday. Um, when I went to confession last Monday, he said, don't pray. I don't want you to pray. I just want you to deal with your darkness and just focus on your darkness so much that you focus so intently on your darkness, all you can see is the light. And that's what caused me to do what I did. So I don't regret anything that I, I do because I think it's an action towards Christ. And since it's St. Gabriel's church, he's their arch angel and that's the one that leads us away from the wickedness and of the devil and that's the reason why i chose that parish one it's my home parish where it should be and two i'm sick and tired of them not um being charismatic yeah. every time i've ever gone there it's just quiet it's sullen it's dull it's boring it doesn't bring people to the church and he says you, you know there's 600 people here and you scared everybody to the point that they're not going to want to come back and said, no, they're not. They're going to come back. They're going to come back even stronger because once they find out who I am and what I'm doing. So I literally handed my donation envelope to the guy and said, would you ensure in case something happens that uh, St. Edward's parish gets the uh, check? Half an hour later, he shows up at St. Edward's and I'm at the front door speaking to a, a bilingual Mexican guy. And he's looking at me like, holy cow, this guy's at this church now. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He didn't know what to make of it. Yeah. So I, right. I, I made my point. Yeah. So thanks for your time, Jerry. All right, brother. Talk to you later. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. All right, everybody. Um, 
that was Scott. Um, another thing that I forgot I was going to bring up, but he, he hung up, but um, is that I really didn't know what he meant by, I know what the Catholic Church means by charismatic, um, but uh, if you walk in a church and, and the mass is dull and boring to you, you have first of all, you have to ask yourself, why is everybody quiet and solemn? Well, the main reason we're supposed to be is no matter what church you're in, Christ is on the altar. He's in he's in the uh, he's in the tabernacle. And so when we enter the sanctuary, we're supposed to be solemn and quiet. The lights are supposed to be down a little bit before mass starts. Um, we're supposed to be um, we're supposed to be very uh, we're supposed to be reflecting on on Christ, on the suffering of Christ before mass starts. That's why when you walk into a Latin mass, which is the traditional church service mass for over 2,000 years, I don't care if you're Catholic or Protestant, that's the way it's supposed to be. Um, and we, we've gotten away from that with the charismatic thing and with Protestants breaking away and then starting their, the, the things that the service that they have. The reason why when you walk in the church, you're supposed to be solemn is because, first of all, we should be preparing ourselves to meditate on Christ, to go through this service and to realize he died for us and to understand what that means. People think church or mass is supposed to be this jumping around hoopla 52 weeks of Easter. That is not the faith. Running around, jumping around, hooping and hollering, oh Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah. That is exactly for what? Easter and Advent, Christmas, okay? Basically twice a year. All the other 50 weeks of the year are designed to focus on the suffering of Christ, his passion. This is why in the church, we go through the readings every, every mass. We go through the readings all year because we're leading up to Easter and understanding what that means. And so when we walk in, when you walk into a Latin mass, and if you go to any church in this country or in the world and you walk into a Latin mass, everybody's quiet. They're why? They're praying, they're meditating, they're getting prepared for the for the sacrifice of the mass. The mass is not a dinner. Church is not a dinner. Church is not a supper. Church is a mass is a sacrifice. Why? Because we look at the cru cru crucifix and that is what we should be doing looking at Christ dying to ourselves. Okay. Please understand that. Um, and I don't, I don't, I don't think, I don't know what Scott really meant and he could probably come back next week and, and talk about it a little bit more, but if he wants to, but I just want you guys to understand what that means. Um, that, you know, we're quiet and solemn. Um, the mass is holy, it's reverent, it's respectful. This is why, because why? Because we should be focusing on the suffering and the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when we get away from that, we the demonic starts to enter us and not to enter us, but to start to influence us. OK, so that's that. All right. That was great. Good job, Scott. Good job, my brother. So let's get on with a break. If you're getting value from this podcast and would like more personal marriage help, visit SaveMyCatholicMarriage.com for an opportunity to work with me personally for free. Yes, within 30 days, learn how to become a better husband that attracts your wife back to you. Visit SaveMyCatholicMarriage.com and get a plan tailored specific to your marriage and situation. I've helped hundreds of men in their marriages. Allow me the chance to help you using my personal and gained experience. Visit SaveMyCatholicMarriage.com for superior coaching for your marriage. Again, SaveMyCatholicMarriage.com. That's SaveMyCatholicMarriage.com to become the man God created you to be and the husband your wife needs. Lastly, I always get the question, why don't you help women? And I always answer them, I do. So for all of you beloved wives out there that want to reignite that feeling of emotional closeness and complete love from your hubby, consider 
marriage coaching and visit SaveMyCatholicMarriage.com for an improved marriage within 30 days. All right. All right. We are back. We are back. So let's get into our Save My Catholic Marriage Minute today. And so I must ask the question. I must ask it. What are the behaviors of a troubled wife? Moreover, what are the clues your wife displays when she's unhappy and considering or planning to leave your marriage? A more important question is why? Do you know? Do you care? Those of us listening who think our wives will never leave, we are in a dream world. And if right now the answer to the question of are you and your wife as emotionally close as you would be or no, or I'm not sure you have entered the wife's exit strategy zone where your beloved is considering she's going to leave because the emotional connection is leaving, has left, or is in the process of leaving. Why? Because for her, this is the most important thing above God, the children, her duty as a wife or mother. Once the closest is gone, she will start telling herself this is not what I signed up for. Then comes the question, can I be happier with him or without him? <laughs> if the answer is I can be happier with him without him, sadly, she will start planning her exit strategy and you, her husband, will not even suspect it. For this reason, the clues in this series are so, so valuable. This is why I read them every day. And matter of fact, we're on clue 21, so we got like nine or ten left. Um, but we do, we, we have the show five days a week, so that'll be over pretty quick. Um, but the reason this is important to me is because I want you men to really start to understand that a marriage, our life, our passion about our beloved, her passion about you, it can come back. It doesn't have to leave. Remember, love is... And marriage is friendship set on fire. When you are best friends with your wife and she is your best friend and you are her best friend, then that is the basis to the great intimacy that you both would love and need. When you're best friends, you're not trying to leave each other. You're not trying to disrespect each other. You're not trying to avoid each other. You're not trying to hold things uh, you're not trying to hold things from each other. You don't lie. You're not. You're not being uh, dis. Um, you're not being uh, dishonest. You know. Um, I teach the men in my program that you must get in the habit of sharing your inner thoughts and your 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 happiness, your desires, your your sadness. You know what's on your mind with your wife. Hey. My wife gets mad at me, not mad, but she gets frustrated at me. You know, I say, hey, I'm going to go to the bathroom. I got to take a poop, <laughs> you know, because that's just me. You know, I get I'm used. To, I want to, you know, I get used to saying what's ever on my mind in front of her. That way she knows what's always on my mind. She can always trust me and she can always know that I'm going to do right by her. If I stop talking and communicating. If I try, I'm not I'm avoiding her, I'm taking too much time at work. I'm I'm going with my buddies a lot. Um, I'm doing all these things that take away from her time and her and our special time together. Any woman, I don't care what woman you have, will start to demand, does he does he love me? I mean, is he still into me? You know, and 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 that's what we we've got to start to understand and think about as men. Even if you're in a great marriage or a good or a good marriage or a legendary marriage right now, you must always ask yourself these questions. Why? So that you stay on top of your game. <laughs> That's what it's about. Staying on top of your game, okay? So, for this reason, the clues in this series are so valuable as they give you an idea of what is to happen if you are willing to see and act upon them. If you make the mistake and think she is being emotional or I'll take care of this later, you'll find that the later never comes and your wife and family have exited stage left. Because I know from experience that no one teaches us how to build a great, loving, passionate, and exciting marriage over decades. Hell, no one even teaches us how to be the man that God created us to be. Okay? And I feel cheated. I'm sure you feel cheated. So in my effort to help you, 
I present to you the clues that if noticed or better yet removed from your marriage will help you rekindle it and save you and your family much pain and agony. In today's episode, we talk about clue number 21. And before I read those, I, I mean, before I go over that, I want you to go over, I want, to, want you to hear the previous 20, okay? And so we're going to take a quick, quick uh, break, and then we will be back. Let's talk about your Catholic marriage problems. Weekdays, 10 a.m. Eastern, live streamed on the Catholic Alpha Radical Facebook page and CatholicAlpha.com. So here we go. Before... Uh, I want to before I tell you what clue number 21 is for today, we're going to talk about the other 20. So, again, as I go over these, please think about your situation, think about your parents' situation, or your friend's situation, or your kid's situation. Any anyone that is having um, marriage problems that you know of, the reason why is believe it or not. The men in my program really give back. Man, once they learn what's going on, even if their wife is favorable to, the, favorable to them or not, they start to absorb their knowledge and their faith and their love of Christ and the love of their wife and their kids. And what starts to happen is people start coming to them and asking them about their situation and their marriage and things like that. And then now, whereas before, the men, they didn't know what to say, right? If somebody came to you right now and said, oh, man, my wife is messing around on me, and she's doing this and that, and we're not having sex, and blah, 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 you'd be like, oh, man, I feel so... Before, they'd be like, oh, man, you'd be like, oh, man, I feel so sorry. <laughs> you know, leave her. Get rid of her, man. Leave her, man. Get rid of her. You know, you 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 feel empathetic for him, but you wouldn't really know what to say or how to help him. You think you're... Most people think if they tell them to leave their husband or leave their or leave their wife that they're helping them. That's not helping the society. That's not helping the institution of marriage. That's not being in union with God and the Trinity. It's not even being in union with that man, his wife, and his children. When we advise our friends and family because of emotion to leave their spouse, we are creating a great, grave, grave misjustice to, to the family, to God, to our society. Why? Because family is the key. Family is the core of the universe. And without it, Satan knows it, we fall. We start to fall for anything. This is why when me and Scott were talking, and we were talking about, you know, people these days don't pass the true faith of God to their children. So the children grow up and they go out in this society and they're unprepared. They're sheep. They're basically sheep among wolves. So what do you do when you don't know nothing? You fall for anything, all right? So with these clues, I want you to please try your best to learn, to pass it on to your friends, to share this podcast. Let's try to, like Scott's trying to do, just try to change this world, this country, one man at a time. And that when you stand before God and you and you, he asks, and he and he says, you know, he looks at you and says, Well done, my son. You know, he will show you all the spirit, all the souls that you brought to him, that you helped bring to him. And that's what you want. And your wife and your children should be hopefully right behind you. Okay. So number one, does she seem distant? Number two, is she spending more time with single friends? Number three, does she seem uninterested in the marital embrace? Number four, is she still as supportive as she used to be? Number five, is she still as loving as she used to be? Number six, does she go out to clubs and events without you? Number seven, does she take longer to answer your texts or phone messages? Number eight, has her conversation with you become very short and to the point? 
Number nine, has the bickering increased? Number 10, has the arguing increased? Number 11, has she started putting the kids above you? Number 12, has she started putting her friends, siblings above you? Number 13, have you stopped going to mass and entered the spiritual battle daily? Number 14, does she seem unusually depressed or unhappy for a longer period of time? Number 15, you make love less than once per week. Number 16, you make love less than once per month. Number 17, has she lost weight for no apparent reason? Number 18, has she started getting her hair done more often for no apparent reason? Number 19, lately, does she dress nicer or more provocatively? Um, and then uh, number 20 is, oh, is uh, she coming home later than normal? Okay. So that being said, what is the number 21 reason that your wife, our wives, everybody's wife may want a divorce? Drum roll, please. <laughs> She blames you for everything going wrong in your marriage. Woo! How many of us men have dealt with that one? <laughs> so, look, marriage killers, the core of communication. Marriage killers is how we hurt each other deeply, cause resentment, and cause intimacy to leave our relationship especially for our wives, man. If your wife is blaming you for all things wrong in your marriage, this means that you are doing marriage killers. So she has started doing marriage killers to you. Now, what are marriage killers, you may ask? I'm so glad you asked, Grasshopper. To be specific, they are arguing with her, bickering with her, debating with her, criticizing her, trying to control her, correcting her behavior, blaming her, complaining, whining, verbally attacking her and defending, reminding her of past wrongs and stopping the need to defend yourself. Woo! How long would it take you to develop all those habits to not to do again? <laughs> okay? Those are important. One thing that is higher than a marriage killer though which damages your marriage severely over time is when you disrespect your wife, meaning when she's talking, you are not listening to her. Fellas, I say it all the time. If your wife's mouth is moving, yours isn't. You look at her in the face, you focus on her, your body language, you lean toward her, you're excited, you ask questions. If you don't, if you need clarification, you don't offer help. You don't say anything. You listen intently. And then when she's done talking, you ask her, you empathize. Oh, man, that's messed up. Oh, wow, that's great. Then you support her. You know, oh, man, it'd be good that you did something like that. Or, man, that's, that's kind of messed up how he did if I were you, blah, blah, blah. Then you ask, you know what? I understand what you just said. That's all fat, well, and good, sweetheart. But, you know, what would you like me to do to help? Can I help? Is there anything I can do? If you are in marriage crisis, if you and your wife are having problems with the communication and intimacy and things like that, what I just told you will improve your marriage. It will, okay? But you got to do it. And you have to leave out the other marriage killers of what? Criticizing, arguing, fighting, blaming, okay? Remember, all of those things I just mentioned further push your wife away and stops your relationship from progressing to greatness. Each time you feel the need to do any of these relationship killing activities, I want you to ask yourself, do you want to be right or do you want your marriage and family back? The way you stop the killing behaviors is if things begin to rise to arguing, you only respond to what your wife, what you agree with your wife, this is what she's saying. You don't respond to things that that that's not true. Why? Because that causes conflict. And, and when you cause conflict with the person, it's, it naturally starts debating and it starts to argue and bickering. 
You cannot, you cannot allow that to happen because when you do eventually and sadly your relationship will regress and your marriage will be over your wife will talk to avoid you why would she start to avoid you because she feels if i say something or any or or talk to him about anything or just say anything he's not going to listen anyway or it's going to cause a fight so that's why wives avoid this is why if your wife nags you all the time you can't do nothing right she blames you for everything. What do you do? You start avoiding her. You don't want to come home. You stay at work 12 hours a day. You stay out all the time. When it's time to come home, you go, oh, man, I don't know. I feel like going home because she's going to get on me because I wasn't home at exactly 5 o'clock. I was there at 5.01, but I wasn't there at 5, so she's going to get on me, right? When your marriage is over, it basically means that you are entering the divorce court sector remember even though your wife blames you for everything and you blame her for everything she is one who is more affected by the marriage killer practice why because she runs on emotion wives run on emotion and when we insult them argue with them yell at them raise our voice at them disrespect them by not listening to what they're saying it hurts them very deeply because women can't take trauma as well as men can so when husbands yell, fight, criticize, argue, etc., it hurts their wives to the core of their being because they are bonded to us. Which means what? We can hurt them much more easily and deeply than anyone else on the planet. This is why one of our missions as men is to protect our wives from ourselves. This is our power as men that we have no clue about. Most of us as men have no clue the power that we that we have right if we're not rich if we're not this big famous athlete or this big famous actor or we're not great in our careers if we're not number one in our careers we feel like we're failures no 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 gentlemen that is not the measure of a man the true measure of a man is your relationship with god if you're if you're right how your wife feels about you and respects you and how your children view you. That's the true measure of a man. We have it so twisted. Believe it or not, man, I'd like to have all that money too. I would, I wish I did, but I don't. So does that mean I'm a lesser man than say Bill Gates? Does that mean that, that, my, that my wife or your wife is a lesser woman because she's not Oprah Winfrey? I mean, come on. If that was the truth, if that was the truth, man, then what are we what are we here for so you're saying a person that's born in haiti or a third world country like that where every day is a struggle just to eat and survive that their life is no not as important as our life in america there there's just bad luck that they were placed in haiti and we're placed in america that's bad luck no it's not bad luck you know what that is God places us where we're supposed to be. Each soul needs something different to come to him. And so some are placed here, some are placed in Africa, some are placed in Haiti, some are placed in Europe, some are placed in Russia, in Asia, or in all these different places. This is where we are. Why? So that we, our souls can experience what God desires for that soul to move closer to him. This is why a person who's rich, they're not supposed to hoard all their money. They're supposed to, to give and serve and love. They have more of a responsibility to the society. The more money you have, the more responsible you are to give and to love and to help. Just like the more you love God and the more God reveals to you as a man and as a woman, the more responsible and the more obliged you are to help others. The more you are obliged to pass that, re that knowledge to other people so that they can come to God as well. This is how the universe works, man. And if you really think about what I'm saying, you will see it. Without God, there's no reason to be good. Without God, 
There is no reason not to murder somebody, not to rape somebody, not to kill somebody, not to abort your, your baby, not to not steal from somebody, not to smack somebody in the face, not to kill our children, not to go out and have all the sex we want with all the women. You know, there's no, without God, this, this, this all means nothing. This is why you have to look at a person that's not a believer or a person that, that is an atheist. You have to look at them and say, man, what are you doing? You, you, th you go through this whole 100 years of pain and suffering, and then you think it's just over? It just makes no logical sense if we as men just sit down for five seconds and just truly think about it. It's not bad luck that a person's born in America and somebody else is born in Haiti. It's not bad luck that somebody's born rich and somebody's not. It's not it has nothing to do with luck. It has to do with our souls and what God needs from us to move closer to him. So again, without God, none of this means anything because eternity in happiness and bliss is what we're aiming for. That this why this world is a test, especially for a man. Are we are we worthy to go to the party? Or am I, as Jerry Jacobs Jr., am I a man worthy of the gift of my relationship with God, of my wife and my children? Am I worthy to go to the big party? Because again, like I said last week, God doesn't let everybody go to the party. Why? Because if you you don't want to come, which means what? You're disobedient your whole life. You're selfish your whole life. You only, you don't go to mass. You don't worship God. You don't talk about the Blessed Mother, the saints. You're not trying to read scripture. You're just, you're not trying to be a good husband or a good father. You're just kind of going along. You think you are, but you're really not. You're just selfish. All that you want to do is consider your wants, desires, and needs. And then at 99.9 .9 years old, you get in a car wreck and you're in a coma. And you're supposed to want to go to the party. You want to go to the party now. No, God goes, look, you don't want to go to the party because you wouldn't be happy at the party. <laughs> you wouldn't. So I'm going to send you to the other party. It ain't really a good party. And it's really bad. But hell is where you want to go because you didn't want to do what it took to get to the good party. You didn't earn your way to the party. So we're going to send you over here, back down this way. And then you can just keep doing what you've been doing for the last 99.9 .9 years. Okay, this is how it works, everybody. This is how it works. And if you don't believe me, it doesn't matter if you believe me or not. The demons believe it. The angels believe it. You know, and that's all that really, the saints believe it. That's all that really matters. Okay. So this is why we got to understand our power as men. You know, and why are husbands so much able to cause so much pain so deep into their wife because you and your wife are bonded bonded through god it means you were married before god you're bonded through the marital embrace you're bonded through the children that you have together this is why when our when this is why when or if a wife has an affair she is still drawn to her husband way more because of the bonds they share the the bonds she has is so much stronger than she has with the guy she's having an affair with. She's just trying to, to, to fill a void that she doesn't have with her husband. But the bond is, is not as strong with him. She's just trying to have a good time. He's just trying to have a good time. But eventually the good time ends, right? It always ends. It always, always ends. Okay? So when we continually do marriage killers on our wives, she begins to become resentful. We become we become resentful too, and she begins to feel her husband doesn't care or love her anymore. And the all-important emotional connection begins to leave her and consequently her marriage or relationship. As you know or should know by now, when the emotional closeness is gone, your beloved desires to leave with it. Again, if your wife is blaming you for everything, basically nagging you, this is the first clue that you have serious marriage problems. But more importantly, this is a gift from God because you have a chance to fix your marriage before the wife's exit strategy really sets in, meaning her leaving, getting another man, moving to another bedroom, asking for a separation, uh, asking for a divorce, filing for divorce, 
getting divorced, fighting for annulment, and getting an annulment. Gentlemen, remove marriage killers, and this remove her nagging. Oh my God, doesn't that world sound so beautiful? Bam! Let's talk about your Catholic marriage problems. Weekdays, 10 a.m. Eastern. Live streamed on the Catholic Alpha Radical Facebook page and CatholicAlpha.com. If you're getting value from this podcast and would like more personal marriage help, visit SaveMyCatholicMarriage.com for an opportunity to work with me personally for free. Yes, within 30 days, learn how to become a better husband that attracts your wife back to you. Visit SaveMyCatholicMarriage.com and get a plan tailored specific to your marriage and situation. I've helped hundreds of men in their marriages. Allow me the chance to help you using my personal and gained experience. Visit SaveMyCatholicMarriage.com for superior coaching for your marriage. Again, SaveMyCatholicMarriage.com. That's SaveMyCatholicMarriage.com to become the man God created you to be and the husband your wife needs. Lastly, I always get the question, why don't you help women? And I always answer them, I do. So, for all of you beloved wives out there that want to reignite that feeling of emotional closeness and complete love from your hubby, consider marriage coaching and visit SaveMyCatholicMarriage.com for an improved marriage within 30 days. All right, all right. Happy Friday, happy Friday, happy Friday, everybody. Woohoo! We rocking it today. Woo! So we have a live caller. We have a live caller, our second caller of the day, which is always awesome and always great. Uh, so what I want to do right now is uh bring them in. So give me one second to unmute. Hello, caller. Are you there? I'm here. I can hear you. Oh, you can just, you hear me? Yeah, you just, I, can you hear me? Yes. You just sound so excited to be here. Oh, wow. We're going to have a really great party, aren't we? <laughs> we'll do what we can. We're going to do what we can. So, um, how can I and the Holy Spirit help you today? Well, I don't know. Oh, shoot. I'm sorry. I'm getting interference on my phone. I, can hear I don't know if, okay, um, well, this isn't really my marriage, but I have a friend who is constantly, well, not, well, whenever I talk to her, she complains about her husband, right? And my husband and I have a small business, and one of the many courses that we took in, in our business was talking to the right person. So her talking to me about her marriage and her husband is not helping because I can't help her. Um, she's talked to her husband, but it's almost like she's accustomed to whining about her husband. And I don't whine about my husband because I don't have any issues with my husband. I mean, I guess if I sat and meditated and thought, what is it about my husband that bugs me? Um, he eats with his hands? I don't know. You know, I mean, but she, <laughs> she complains about him and he's a sweet guy and you know, he does his best, but he is a man, and men don't change, and I don't know. It just it gets on my nerves because, you know, she's almost like, well, you know how you're a kid, and you, you know, show me yours, I show you mine. Well, it's almost like she's, well, I'm telling you mine, tell me yours. And I, I cannot get into that. So should I just say to her, you know, and, and I have gently said, well, have you talked to him about it? But then she rolls her eyes and says, he won't listen to me. Exactly. <laughs> so she hasn't. <laughs> so she hasn't talked to him about it. So what do I do? Okay. Don't talk to her. That's what I do. I avoid talking to her. Okay. First of all, she's in avoidance. So... She'll ask him for a divorce. It might not be this year or six months from now or five years or 20 years, but eventually she will ask him for a divorce. She will leave because that's how women are. I, he, cause the, I, when you were talking, I already knew what to read, what you were going to say that he's done listening to me. That's why I won't say nothing to him. And I covered that today. The reason 
that she won't talk to him is because she feels she can't talk to him. Women uh-huh. are complicated, but they're not. It's a base. It, it's it's not that complicated if you really analyze it. But the problem is, men we don't analyze nothing that about our wife. If you listen to your wife and you empathize with her, you let her talk. You don't interrupt. Well, if you do interrupt, is to ask a question or something like that for clarification. And she uh-huh. feels that she can talk to you. And you're not giving her marriage killers. He's not giving her marriage killers like arguing and fighting and blaming and criticizing and all that kind of stuff. Eventually, Mm -hmm. his wife will listen to him and trust him and say things to him and come to him when there's a problem. Mm -hmm. And she won't be scared that he's going to yell at her and call her names and call her uh, you know what and and, and all that kind of stuff. That's why your friend Mm -hmm. won't talk to her because she's already tried to talk to him many, 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 many times. Okay, and if you uh-huh. you if you think it back in your life, that's happened to you too with a man. <laughs> I try to talk to him for five years, and he just won't listen to me. Okay, he does his own thing. Now, women don't really mind a man doing his own thing. That's part of us loving each other and us giving each other their space. But uh-huh. when a man doesn't listen to his wife when she's trying to talk to him. What happens is she feels disrespected and he's not listening to me. That he so which means what translates to what? If a husband is not listening to his wife, she starts to think, huh, I guess he don't love me then. Mm-hmm. And so what starts to happen? Mm-hmm. Emotional closeness is gone. So I kind of said today. Mm-hmm. Now, women need an outlet. This is why, as a as him not listening to her and disrespecting her by not listening to her, he is missing a big clue. First of all, Men don't understand with women, they need an outlet. So if, I, if, if I'm listening to her and embracing her and really into her and really want to be with her and we have good conversations, what will happen is she'll want to have sex with him more. <laughs> she will. Am I right or wrong? Mm-hmm. Am I right or wrong on that one? Oh, you're, I, you're, I think you're right. I think you're right. That's what I mean. Usually... It, uh, the intimacy in the marriage will, will will increase more for the woman if she feels closer to her husband. And right now, your friend does not feel close to her husband. That's why she's talking to you. So here's how you handle it. What you do is you do what her husband's not doing, but you do a, you do you add to that. And what you do is you turn it around and reflect it back to him. You lead her back to him. So you try your best to give her the best advice that you can, which is not leave him, not disrespect him, not nag him, but to say, keep trying your best to talk to him. Keep because what what is a woman's what is a wife's job? A wife's job is to guide her husband. It is so powerful. Uh-huh. But women today, they don't use that either. That's their problem. You know, they rather avoid. Because they, they don't want to get they don't want to get trounced up on instead of really trying to help their husband. What you do is we are we are men. It takes us a hundred, two hundred, three hundred, four hundred times before we get something. Sometimes, <laughs> for real, that's how we are. And as a woman, once what as a woman, once you guys know that, then you should be able to deal with us better. Go ahead. Well, who wants to deal with having to tell somebody something five hundred times? Because that's your job. <laughs> That's your sacrifice. Yes. That's your sacrifice. (laughs) See, that's the problem. Women want men to sacrifice and die for them and give them what they want and satisfy and fulfill them and serve them. And then, and then when the man, when it comes to them to return it, they fight it. I got to tell him something 500 times. Oh, dang, that's messed up. I want to do that. I ain't got time for that. I got to go do with these kids over here. Look. That's why ain't nobody got time for that. That's why. <laughs> that's why your priority has to be straight. Your priority is God first. What would God have you do? God would say, "Look, whatever you got to do to get your husband to heaven, that's what you got to do." And if it takes telling him something five million times, that's what your job as a wife is to do. That's how you sacrifice for something bigger and better than yourself. The other thing okay. is, that's it. I mean, really, that's really it. Then your marriage comes second. Your marriage comes second. 
if you want to stay married as a woman, a woman, and most women do, all women do, once they choose you, they want to be married to you. They don't want somebody else unless you, you as a man screw up so bad it makes them. Then your, uh -huh. your second priority is your marriage. And so you have to do what it uh, takes to guide your husband through your marriage. Go ahead. You got to go. go yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Wait. Go ahead. I can, I can listen. I can listen. Um, I'm in the middle of something. I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> I know. I get to go because okay. I really want to help you. So, but hey, thanks for calling and, you know, call again next but, week. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I can listen off, off the phone. Oh, okay. I was almost done anyway, but so thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye. So that's what I was trying to get to. You know, a women, they have a responsibility too, man. You know, I talk to my guys all the time, the guys that I work with, and yeah, I drill it into what they have to do to be better men and become worthy of God and their marriage and their family. But we also, they also know, well, that's why my we me and my men get along with each other because they know I'm not like some marriage counselor trying to blame them for everything. It might, when you first start talking to me and we meet, meet the first time and I start helping you the first time, it might seem like I'm only on your wife's side, but I'm not. I'm on God's side and marriage side. So what I, but what I had to do as a, as your coach Look at me as a football coach or a military instructor. I have to break you down and get you to open up your mind because you're a man and it's hard for you to listen. So if I allow you to be in your dream world, am I really helping you? Do I love you? Do I really care for you? Do I really have your best interest at heart if I allow you to be in a dream world continuously and be like everybody else in this society tells you? Oh, man, leave your wife. Oh, man, she ain't nothing. Oh, man, you're right, dude. Oh, everything you're saying is right, man. Everything is right. Everything you're doing is right. Everything's right. No, you need somebody who cares enough to tell you the truth. And that's what love is. That's what taking... That's what having somebody else's best interest at heart is. So when we work together first, I got to tell you the truth about yourself, even though I try to do it in an empathetic way. But even today, with a lot of people, with most people, I would say most people, no matter how you put criticism, even if it's positive or it's negative, it doesn't matter. They still get mad at you. So I don't care. I can't care about that. I can't care about your feelings like that. The only thing I can try to do is be empathetic and sympathetic to your situation to let you know that I've been where you are and I really do have your best interest at heart. But God and the Holy Spirit and Jerry Jekyll Jr., man, we can't just help you in your misery. We can't help you in your twilight zone. We have to bring you out so that you can see the world and your situation the way it really is. And it's not that I'm mad at you or don't like you. Really, it's because I do care about your situation. And I understand that if I, if you come to me and I talk like everybody else, what's the reason you listen to me? It's like the Catholic Church right now. Most priests in the Catholic Church have handcuffs behind their back. They can't talk about the issues that really matter, which is what? Death, judgment, heaven, hell, which includes what? Abortion, same-sex attraction, contraception, no-fault divorce, uh, all of those kind of things tough issues. Those are not political issues, fellas. Those are moral issues. And so the priest's hands are tied behind their back because if they start talking about death, judgment, heaven, and hell, then what happens is the bishops get complaints from one or two crazy people, and then they send that priest to Siberia somewhere, and he's by himself out in a boondock somewhere, which most people don't want to be out there. I'd love to be out there, but a lot of folks don't want to be out there, okay? That's the way it is. If, if you teach the truth, Christ's word, you will have way more than one billion people. Matter of fact, you will have a, a engaged force of fighting Christian soldiers. But right now, we don't have that. That's why you need me and the Holy Spirit to help get you on track. Okay? And so that's what we're dealing with. That's what we're dealing with, you know, and um, our wise I'm not on the wife's side. I'm really not. But you need me to help you make a plan, and I can't help you make a plan if you if um, if 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 I, if I like to be in a dream world. And believe me, I do understand that your wife has problems too. But we're not trying. To, we're not talking about your wife right now. We're talking about you because, by God, you are here responsible. You are the leader, the server. 
the protector, the defender. And until you change yourself, your wife and kids ain't going to change themselves. That's just the way it is. It's not that they're doing it on purpose. It's because it's the way God has set it up. This is why when you take full responsibility for your house, just like the Klingons of Star Trek. <laughs> I, of course, you know, you're all about that. I'm a Star Trek fan. I love it, love it, love it. But the Klingons, that's why they, they take responsibility for their house. They know that as men, I am responsible for my house. Everything that goes on in there is my responsibility. So you're not just going to come in there, including the government, you're not just going to come in there and tell me what to do in my house. OK, and that's how you as a man have to start to think. And I promise you, your life will be better because you will, even though you don't like it as a man, your sense of protection and, and fulfillment as a man will kick in and you'll go, you know what? I don't like that. But you know what? It is what it is. I, that's my job. That's my job. But see, we're not taught this from 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 when we're born. We should be taught the concepts that 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 God wants from us as a man from from the first when we're first born why so that we can influence our environment that's what a man's supposed to do we're supposed to influence our environment okay we can't change we can't influence the world we can't influence russia we can't influence Ukraine what is that place ukraine we can't influence japan but we as a man we can be like saint joseph and influence our home or our environment, our church, our work, our home, um, our friends, our parents, all of that. This is your job. This is your mission as a man to spread the love of God that you're, that, that, and you give that love from God to your wife. Your wife gives that love from you to your children, and then you lead everybody right back to God again. Okay? And I hope that you guys understand that. Because huh, that is just the way it is. Bam! <laughs> <laughs>